So we're looking at part 20 here in our Wild Harvest Edibles series that prepares the table uh, before me. And as we usually do, just want to remind you that uh, as you navigate any health challenge that you want to have a provider that has a similar philosophy of care that you do. And that anything you learn along the way would be something that uh, is educational in nature that you would take the time to do your due diligence and find out um, the way to apply it in your situation. <clears throat> so tonight we're gonna to be looking at the rose, the wild rose in particular. Uh, so there are many, many different species of, of wild rose and they all have, have medicinal properties. Uh, those that are, are, uh, have the most scent associated with them typically have the greatest medicinal value. Now, I don't know about you, but typically when I smell a rose that I buy at the store or someone's rose garden, they aren't as, as uh, fragrant as the wild roses that I've encountered. Uh, although the, the cultivated ones do have similar healing properties, they're not as potent as the wild varieties. Uh, the fragrance is a good test of their medicinal properties. <clears throat> their flavor properties probably are going to follow right along with their, with their uh, fragrance properties. The more fragrant ones are going to be more uh, palatable and more uh, interesting flavors for your food. So there's, there's a couple different wild Pacific uh, Northwest rose, rose species. The first one is the Nootka rose has large flowers like you would see in the upper picture as compared to the other wild rose species. So it has uh, typically large thorns and it can make quite large hedges. And <clears throat> it spreads uh, from its place of origin and uh, can make quite large bushes. Uh, has very large hips, that, that's the part that is below the blossom that forms um, after it's been in bloom and been pollinated. So interestingly enough, the rose and the apple are in the same family, rosaceae. Uh, so basically the rose hip is an ovary of the rose, rose ovary, and the apple is the ovary of uh, an apple blossom. So there are many, many large spines on the Nootka rose, and the other one is the bald hip rose. So it's very small flowers. You can see the hedge there. It's kind of a viney, um, more trailing, kind of climby rose than the Nootka rose. The Nootka rose is more of a hedgy kind of a rose bush versus a, a viney. Lots of tiny spines all over it. And it's called the bald hip rose because the hip you can see here doesn't have the sepals associated with it. We'll see other pictures here that have the sepals on it that get left behind and hence it is a bald hip. So the bald hip rose. <clears throat> so they, they are also fragrant and have a good edibility of their petals as well as medicinal qualities. So the edibility of the, um, of the, the rose is from the sepals and the petals as well as the hips. Uh, typically they um, are gonna be used in rose syrups, jams and various flavorings. The hips are tangy, uh, that you're gonna be eating the portion of the hip that is uh, around the seeds, there's a thin skin. So like an apple has a, a large kind of fleshy area between the skin and the seeds. And there's only about five or six seeds in an apple. The, the rose has lots of seeds in, in the hip and the, the um, actual kind of skin and flesh part is fairly small as in comparison. And we'll see a picture of a cross section of that here in a little bit. So they have a high vitamin C content. Uh, their flavor is similar to that of cranberry. The seeds themselves can be kind of uh, bristly. You really don't want to consume the seeds. They're not toxic, but they can be irritating to the GI tract, both in your mouth, kind of like splinters probably, um, and also all the way through the GI, GI tract. So eating the seeds themselves is not recommended, but the rose hip itself is, is edible and high in vitamin C. So you might see a vitamin C preparation that you can purchase that says vitamin C with rose hips. Well, the idea is that the rose hips form of vitamin C is more bioavailable than the commercially prepared uh, varieties that are often from, from corn or other, other uh, sources and are not as potent as naturally sourced like acerola cherry or even uh, the Australian bush plum is very high in, in the vitamin C, but uh, the, the, the wild rose 
um, hip skin is also high in vitamin C. So you can use a tea ball or bag to prevent exposure to the seeds. <clears throat> so you use the flowers, the petals of the rose for a, a, a garnish for salads. Uh, you can use them in lots of different creative ways on top of cakes or, or uh, various different things. <clears throat> so the petals are the primary portion that are, are eaten in conjunction with the, the rose hips. From a medicinal standpoint, they have a lot of different properties and particularly the rose hips. You can see this is a, a, a rose hip here that shows the sepals. So this is not a bald hip rose. Looks like more of a cultivated rose because the spines aren't, aren't large and, and uh, a wide variety. Looks more like a cultivated variety, but it has a nice large hip and it has the sepals attached to it there. The bald hip rose, as you noted earlier, doesn't have the sepals attached to it. So it has antiseptic properties, uh, anti-inflammatory properties. So the vitamin C is an antioxidant, um, antiviral properties, uh, digestive benefits, uh, functions as a nervine, as a sedative, and helps in wound healing. So again, the, the, one of the primary components of that is the vitamin C that gives it its richness and uh, uh, medicinal values and benefits. So for flus and colds, especially viral-based il illnesses, it's very beneficial. So it's a very good, uh, supporter of the immune system and aids in the, the progression through flu and cold-like symptoms. The flu-based viruses are, are uh, corona family virus, so just like the one we're kind of working through right now across the world. Uh, corona is just a, a type of, of virus, and it's a whole family of viruses, which is the flu virus in particular. And rhinoviruses are the ones that are particularly uh, indicated for uh, the rhinocephalon, essentially is the nose brain. So rhino refers to uh, horn or nose, and a rhinovirus is gonna be one that's affecting a nasal mucosa and causing a droopy nose. <clears throat> so rose petal tea, very helpful for colds and flu. So just uh, to make a rose petal tea, take two to four teaspoons of dried crushed rose petals or take three to four tablespoons of the fresh rose petals. So you can use fresh or dried and take a cup of boiling water and cover the petals with the water. Let that steep for 10 to 15 minutes and then drink it as needed to relieve the symptoms of the cold or flu. Uh, you can just use that just generally as a preventative, uh, but you may uh, want to add a squeeze of fresh lemon, kind of adds to the vitamin C component and one to two teaspoons of, of raw honey can help uh, make it less tart. So an infusion of rose petals and black elderberries can also be helpful, kind of, kind of add to that. We know that elderberries and black elderberries are, are very help, helpful. Substantia nigra is uh, very good for immune support. So adding those th two things together can have a synergistic uh, support component for the immune system. Respiratory system support, so it can function in fever reduction. So using the rose hips and petals again for that. Uh, so function as an, as an anti-spasmodic. So someone has a coughing fits uh, or asthma, so that's basically bronchial level and bronchioles level, the very tiny passageways, the smooth muscle is spasming, constricting, can help to relieve asthma symptoms as well as coughing that are uh, the larger uh, bronchi that have mucus that may be trying to be brought up or an irritation. So it helps receive, relieve the, the muscle cramps associated with like a congested cough that's just kind of going and going because it's hard to, hard to stop. It has antibacterial, antiviral uh, properties. So aiding and removing the cause of what's causing you to be ill anyway, to begin with. So beginning to just remove the, the symptom causing agents. Again, the rose petal and rose hip tea can help bronchial infections as well as congestion. It's also helpful in various issue, issues of menstrual, uh, cramps and procedures. So menstrual congestion and pain, reproductive health support, the rose hips, the leaves are indicated here, as well as petals. So using the rose petals can aid in regulation of menstrual cycles and can overcome delays in, in the menstrual cycle. Sometimes there are things that cause a, a period delay and that can bring that back into regularity. So in that regard is kind of uh, functions in a, um, immune modulator, not immune modulator, but a, a, a modulator um, type of a role where it helps to upregulate and, and moderate uh, physiological activity. <clears throat> 
So it functions as a uterine tonic for healing infection, various cysts uh, or uh, bleeding, uh, can soothe and calm the nervous system and eases uh, premenstrual syndrome, cramping, tension, and pain. So the rose petal tea can be a very beneficial uh, thing if that's something that is being uh, experienced um, at any time. So it has a tonic effect. So remember a tonic is something that generally tends towards health, helping to improve the function of a physiological system, your body. And uh, it uh, is functions that way with the rose petals and the hips. Uh, they're very high in vitamin C, A, uh, B3, D, and E. So D and E are interesting. Actually, A, D, and E are both all three interesting because they're fat soluble vitamins and they are present in the rose hips and petals. So that's kind of an interesting uh, thing to find there. So vitamin D typically we think of as being sourced uh, from sun activity in the skin. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that's the primary source that we can get it from. Although you can also get it from other animal sources. Uh, most vitamin D supplements are made from lanolin, which is uh, the oil from sheep's wool. Cod liver oil is a very high source of that. But if you go to the plant sources of where they get it, um, you can get it from there as well. <clears throat> They obviously aren't getting it from, from rose hips, but it's interesting that we can get it from rose hips. The dark color, the dark orange color there you see in the cross section of the rose hip here is where your vitamin A is gonna come through. We think of carrots as being a good source of vitamin A, and that's because of their, their dark orange and yellow coloration. And then vitamin E, again, is a fat soluble vitamin. C and B, those are water soluble vitamins. Also various minerals, antioxidants are gonna be present and pectin. So there's gonna be a lot of pectin there. You could maybe use that uh, in, a, in a canning process. Also has a mild laxative and diuretic effect. So diuretic basically is gonna aid the body in uh, moving fluid through it, the kidney, uh, upregulate kidney activity. So that can, in that role, it can help the body remove toxins. Also excess fluid and help to maintain the movement of the lymph <clears throat> through the lymph nodes. Remembering, 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 of course, that lymph is uh, extracellular fluid that is in the uh, tissues that is moved outside the circulatory system, but is moved through a series of lymph nodes that filter it and ultimately returns back to the circulatory system near the heart. Functions as a mood enhancer, soothing uh, effect on the nervous system. So you can use rose water. So rose water is essentially water that has had rose petals soaked in it. A rose oil, which is a, uh, infusing the petals into an oil, olive oil or something like that, almond oil. Or you can use a rose tincture. So it's a longer process. Both the infusion and tincture are, are longer um, property, medicinal property extraction procedures. We'll talk about that a little bit later here. And then you can use uh, the tea from the hips uh, or the, the rose petals. So they can help with mood enhancement. <clears throat> Can aid the circulatory system. So here's a picture of the Nootka rose. Most of the rose are done blooming this time of year, uh, but they're very fragrant. The hips should be coming on and, and forming quite nicely at this time of year. Uh, rose petal tea promotes blood circulation. That's a good thing. So people who are suffering from poor circulation, this can help enhance it. It reduces capillary swelling below the skin. <clears throat> so that's, that's a good thing. It helps to maintain blood flow at the skin surface level. So drink the tea. You can use the tea as a skin wash if you have areas of skin that the circulatory system is not moving through appropriately. So it can aid in the vasodilation effects of the blood vessels there. Liver support and gallbladder uh, support. So the gallbladder is actually a little, little um, structure that is in, embedded in the liver and it responds primarily to fat and cholesterol. It's actually a cholesterol derivative and functions in fat emulsification breaking it down so it's more digestible and absorbable by the body. And people who have gallstones typically have high fat diets. And it's been advocated by Dr. McDougall that if you have a gallstone that hurts a little bit when you have a high fat diet, just leave it in place. It can kind of act as a barometer and let you know when you're eating too much fat. And when you're not eating much fat, it's not going to be symptomatic. So asymptomatic when you're eating a low fat diet like you ought to, but it'll talk to you when you start eating a high fat diet. So it's probably a good idea just to leave it in place. Aside from the fact that uh, if you disrupt the gallbladder, it can 
uh, reduce its competency and disrupt the, the muscular action of that and cause a, a continuous bile drip into the colon intestines, causing an irritation that can later lead to intestinal cancer and other irritations. So it's best to leave the gallbladder in place, change your diet to have it function less often um, because the fat doesn't need to be emulsified. So it aids the body in removing toxins, eliminating them. And uh, remember that, that fat in any animal, including ourselves, is a toxin storage tissue. So it's best to get any fat that we do consume from, from plants. Uh, and the little that we need is gonna be in the cellular structures of those plants and seeds that, that we might eat. <clears throat> so rose petal tea is gonna be a beneficial uh, aid to the gallbladder and liver and help it to be healthy. So skin issues, uh, the rose petals again are functioning in this role. So it can function in antiseptic, antiviral, anti-inflammatory roles. So like rashes or things like that. So it's good for wounds and bruises, various incisions. So think about thinking about uh, having scar tissue and things like that. It's always been recommended in the past to put like vitamin E oil on it to help reduce scarring. Well, look at that. The, the rose hips and, and petals have vitamin E in them. Very interesting. They help to reduce, reduce scarring because they have that vitamin E in them already. So you can wash the area with rose tea or rose water. You can actually make a, a poultice of the bruised petals if they're fresh and apply them to the area that's affected on the skin. So again, wounds. So we talked about it being a vulnerary, being a, a wound healer. Um, and uh, that would also be the same with an incision. An incision is a purposeful wound that will be used to cut during the surgical procedure, for example. So an eye wash, use uh, rose water for an eye wash. So it's very soothing and cooling effect on the, on the eyes and treat uh, eye infections or irritations. So use sterile rose water, ro rose water from chlorine-free water uh, when you're doing an, an eye wash. So you don't want to use uh, water that's been chlorinated. So if you have water, like city water, you don't have access to other kinds of water. You don't have any distilled water around. You can use water that has been set on the counter and allowed to off gas. So over a period of time, the chlorine will off gas out of the water. That's why you have to keep adding chlorine to a pool because it continues to off gas. You have to maintain the concentration to keep it clean. <clears throat> So GI tract issues, uh, various things like ulcers, bacterial infections of the stomach from E. coli, for example, or H. pylori. So we have E. coli and, and Helobacter pylori present, but they can overgrow if given the opportunity to do that. Um, the urinary tract, uh, the colon. So the rose oil, uh, and you can use a, an appropriate carrier oil for the rose oil. You can use that for internal organ uh, treatments. It's antiseptic, so that's a, that's a body cavity infection when you have sepsis. Uh, Anti-inflammatory, you can have antiseptic, which is basically antibacterial, anti-pathogenic, um, like antiseptic washes and things like that. Um, so the rose water could be used in that way at the surface of the skin as well as interior. So it's very, very good for anti-inflammatory and antiseptic properties. A diarrhea treatment would be to use rose hips, rose hip tea uh, to help soothe the GI. Again, you don't want to have the seeds associated with that because that could cause additional irritation. So when harvesting, it's best to uh, harvest when the morning dew is still on the roses, which brings to mind the song, I come to the garden alone. Uh, while the dew is still on the roses, that's the best time to harvest uh, rose petals. And it turns out that's actually the best time to harvest a lot of different things is in the morning when they've had the night to kind of re-imbibe the water without having photosynthesis taking place. They tend to become more perky and there are volatile oils that are more present in plants in the morning or over the course of a hot day in particular, like we've been having. Those volatile oils are released into the air. Uh, going down our driveway, you can smell the, the sign of the the scent of the pine and the cedar that is being released with this hot weather that we've been having. Mm. So during the spring and summer, if you have a rose plant, just pick up to a third of the petals from any given plant, uh, making sure that there's enough petals left behind to aid in the hip formation and attracting insects to the, the rest of the hips on the plant. 
just after the flowers have opened is the optimal time to pick the petals and leave the stamen, uh, that's the center portion that has the pollen on it, uh, behind. You just want the petals. So the bees will pollinate, even though they'll be less attracted to those without petals, they will still move through and, and pollinate uh, and allow those hips to mature into for a fall harvest. So the rose hips, you're gonna be waiting until fall. So the picture here shows some nice ready to harvest rose hips. Rose hips will stay on through the winter, but they become less and less potent and begin to start to shrivel. And by springtime, there may still be a few remnants around, but they're gonna be a lot less desirable than they would have been in the fall. Spring, you're gonna be using all the way through fall, you can harvest the rose leaves. The rose leaves aren't used nearly as much as the petals and the hips, but they do have an application that we mentioned earlier. So no, uh, don't use plants or parts of plants that have been in a yard or a garden where they've used chemicals to enhance their, their growing capacity or to remove bugs from them like Japanese beetles or something like that. You don't wanna use anything that would have any kind of a toxin associated with it if you're using it for food or for medicinal purposes. Because typically when you're using something for medicinal purpose, you're gonna be using a concentrated form of it and you're gonna concentrate toxins at the same time. So just be sure anything that has an ornamental capacity in a yard, for example, or along a roadside, uh, you wanna steer away from that. Uh, any, anytime you're looking at anything for food or for uh, medicinal properties. So some, some recipes. Um, you wanna take, uh, um, uh, some freshly picked rose petals, and uh, this is for the, the rose oil, uh, organic almond oil, or olive oil is what I'm looking for, not live oil, should be olive oil, and a quarter teaspoon of vitamin E, uh, a wide mouth glass jar with a tight lid. So you're going to sterilize that jar, so you can do that simply by putting it in boiling water, allow it to uh, heat, and then cool. Uh, and so it'll be a sterile jar. So you'll fill that with fresh rose petals, pack it in to completely fill the jar. So most things you don't pack in, but this particular one they're, they're advising pack it in and cover the petals with oil. Use a spatula to run around the edges to make sure that all the trapped air gets out and that the oil gets all through the rose petals. Cover it with a lid and then steep that for about two weeks. Shake that uh, oil petal mixture on a daily basis. And then once your two weeks have been arrived at, then strain that oil through cheesecloth to remove the, the petal bits. You're gonna actually do a, a double extraction. So you'll pack the jar again with fresh petals and then use that extracted oil back into that first jar with fresh petals. Steep it two more weeks, shaking daily. And then once you've completed that double extraction of two batches of rose petals with the same oil, you're gonna add the vitamin E as a preservative and uh, it'll have a mild rose fragrance associated with it. You can store that, label it, store it in a dark location. You can use it all by itself, straight, uh, or sometimes we refer to that as neat when you're talking about essential oils. This isn't really an essential oil, but it is a, an oil infusion. Or you can use it in ointments, uh, balms, or various types of salves as an additive. Rose water. Uh, you're gonna be doing a similar kind of thing, only using water, so fresh petals. So use uh, spring water or fresh water a glass jar with a tight lid. So you're gonna use a, fill a saucepan on the stove with, with the rose petals. Cover the petals with water and then bring that to a simmer uh, at, with a low heat and simmer that for five minutes. Allow that water to cool down naturally and then strain and squeeze the moisture out of the petals. So you're actually physically gonna be squeezing the petals and you can put them in cheesecloth and squeeze that cheesecloth and all that liquid you're gonna pour into a glass jar and that's rose water. It can be drunk straight or used as a wash and then you can store that in the refrigerator and use uh, as needed. So this is a beautiful picture of a rose and it's associated hips. It looks like it's probably not a wild rose necessarily, um, but it's a good example of the rose petals and, and the rose hips that are used for both edible purposes and medicinal purposes. And that's the, that's the wild rose.